What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Wednesday, April 10th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, the U.S. urgently needs a bigger grid. Here's a fast solution. Next up, in a short news segment, pipeline company environmental group strike, quote, unique benefits agreement is an absolutely interesting story. I will then toss it to myself and quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas finance markets, followed by a little bit of um, what we saw with the API uh, forecasting what you will hear the EIA reports for crude oil inventories. I will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys, here on a solo show today. As always, I am Michael Tanner. Stu is out on assignment. So as always, I will hold the fort down. Let's go ahead and kick us off, though. First, first story I wanted to cover, the U.S. urgently needs a bigger grid. Here's a fast solution. You know, one of the biggest obstacles to expanding clean energy in the United States is our massive lack of power lines. Building these new transmission lines can take basically more than a decade. It's absolutely unbelievable. But according to a re- recent report released Tuesday, there actually is a cheaper solution. You can actually go in and replace these existing power lines with, quote, state-of-the-art materials that could roughly double the capacity of the electric grid in many parts of the country, making room for much more electrical capacity. This technique, and I'm reading directly from the article right now, this technique known as advanced reconductoring is actually widely used in other countries, but many U.S. utilities have been slow to embrace it because of their unfamiliarity with the technology as well as the regulatory and bureaucratic hurdles according to the research. This is unbelievable. So this is a senior, I'm going to quoting now a senior scientist, Amol Pradak. He's out of the University of California, Berkeley, who said, we are pretty astonished at how big of an increased capacity you can get by reconductoring. It actually, he goes on to say, quote, it's not the only thing we need to do um, is upgrade the grid. It's not the only thing we need to do to upgrade the grid, but it can be a major part of the solution. What's crazy, though, is that this has already been proven not only around the country, but in the United States. So in 2011, AEP, a utility in Texas, urgently needed to deliver, and again, I'm reading directly from the article, urgently needed to deliver more power to the Rio Grande, uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley to meet soaring population growth. It would have taken too long to acquire land and permits to build towers for new transmission lines. Instead, they turned to this refactoring idea and replaced about 240 miles of existing line with these advanced conductors it took less than three years and increased the comparing carrying capacity of the lines by over 40 percent which is unbelievable so you wind and solar junkies out there you should all be for advanced conductoring because it can absolutely do exactly that so the why hasn't this really happened yet well there's an interesting article um or part of this article where basically it says You know, the incentives are also a little bit mismatched. I'm going to go back to reading straight from the article now. Because of the way in which utilities are compensated, they often have more financial incentives to build new lines rather than upgrading existing equipment. Well, that's sweet. I'm glad that's the incentive so that we can have a suboptimal grid. That's great to know. Conversely, now I'm back reading from the article. Conversely, some regulators are wary of the higher upfront cost of advanced conductors. Quote, even if they pay out for themselves in the long run, many utilities have also also little motivation to cooperate with one another on long-term plant transmission planning. And that comes back to the fact that the United States is run on three grids by over 3,200 different utilities and a massively complex patchwork network of regional planners and regulators. So trying to get anybody on the same consensus is super tough. But if those are the only two things holding us back from a better grid, we already knew this. We're idiots, though. We've got to... I was reading this article like, wait, it's already here. The text proven. We've already actually used this in Texas. It's unbelievable, folks. It makes you think they don't want the grid to get better. It makes you pause and think, do they actually want to make the grid better or do they want to? Or what do they want to do? I, I don't even I won't even speculate on what they want to do. The point is, I have a feeling they're either dumb. They're not dumb. So which means they must know. And it means there there's other quote unquote mismatched incentives. So absolutely crazy article, guys. We, we can have a bigger grid. Let's move to the next one here. Pipeline company environmental groups strike unique community 
Benefits Agreement. Super interesting here. Developer of a carbon dioxide pipeline pipeline, and environmental group have struck a, quote, one-of-a-kind agreement to ensure, quote, community benefits from a pipeline as well as support for the project. Interesting. So this is a CO2 pipeline project um, that's running through Nebraska right now. Kansas-based tall grass is converting a 392-mile-long natural gas pipeline to transport CO2, according to the announcement Tuesday, with agreement from Bold Alliance, the subsidiary of Bold Nebraska, one of the leading opponents of the Keystone XL crude oil pipeline. College Grass is converting the Trailblazer Pipeline, which runs from Beatrice, Nebraska, to eastern Wyoming to Gary Carbon Dioxide, generated by ethanol plants for sequestration deep underground in Wyoming. The goal is to meet the demand for less carbon intensive biofuels in states seeking environmental benefits. I have mixed feelings on this one. I think it's great that we're getting buying from the environmental crowd. I do think we need to look at carbon emissions and and do some of this stuff. I, I do think sequestration is going to become a thing. But was is this pipeline producing? If this pipeline wasn't producing, which I'm not sure if it is because they're going to converting it into CO2, well, that's, or could they not continue to operate the natural gas pipeline because of this this bold Nebraska and bold alliance thing? I don't necessarily know. The article doesn't necessarily say, so I don't want to speculate. However, though, it's going to be super, super interesting to see how this goes forward if all of a sudden now these alliances are going to be strong-arming pipeline companies to convert existing infrastructure into CO2 pipelines where, and this is me from a finance perspective, I don't know how you make money on carbon sequestration. Is it the carbon credits? Is it we're transporting all this CO2, so now we're going to go ahead and get all of these specific carbon credits associated with it? I don't absolutely, I don't actually know. All I know is tall grass, according to these bold uh, alliance folks, is the first pipeline company that has been willing to engage proactively, acknowledging the needs for land owner benefits and generally commits itself to addressing benefits in a written leak. A lot of this comes down to um, some eminent domain issues that are going to go on with some of the extensions of this pipeline. But, folks, it's really interesting to see what's going on here um, in, in terms of, of where the CO2 sequestration stuff goes. We will make sure to keep you guys abreast there. Before I move into the finance section, I just want to quickly pay the bills here, guys. As always, the news and quote-unquote analysis you've just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. The team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Check out the description below for all links and timestamps to the article. If you're on Spotify, you can hit the chapters very easily. We'll work on a solution uh, for iTunes at the moment. Um, check us out on YouTube. You can also check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your data and energy news combo. Um, again, www.energynewsbeat.com. But let's go ahead and move into finance. Uh, we, we see uh, overall markets fairly flat today. We're only up about five ten or about one tenth of a percentage point. NASDAQ was up about four tenths of a percentage point. We saw two and 10 year yields fairly flat with 10 year yields actually down about a tenth of a percentage point. Dollar index fairly flat. We see Bitcoin down three, three and a half percentage points currently trading just below 70,000 there at 69,134. Crude oil has itself a little bit of a down day. We were down about 1.3 percentage points off yesterday's high. Crude oil, WTI, currently sitting at 85.23. Brent oil down only about a half a percentage point, currently sitting at 89.61. Natural gas um, pops a little bit, 1.5 percentage points, currently sitting at $1.87. I think the, the interesting thing to note about crude oil prices is this comes after the second day of talks for a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, you know, they're... they're, they're really is an interesting conundrum there was these talks held in cairo um which ironically the you the cia was there so who knows if it's those talks well, i'm just reading the article apparently there are talks in cairo and they went out to point out that the director of the cia was there um and of course so so far they failed to reach a breakthrough of course because it's just the cia I'm just i'm now i'm I'm sounding a little bit like stupid. He'd be proud of me for for bringing up some sort of conspiracy. But the point is, this ceasefire now 
um, between uh, Hamas and Israel seems maybe a little bit more likely. Part of, again, what was baked into where prices was going was that geopolitical risk. Now I think what we're going to see is maybe some of these tensions continue to die down. Who knows? Things can turn on a dime. We're now going to go back to the question, and we talked. I talked about this yesterday on the show, the short squeeze that Russia, Saudi, and OPEC is really doing, I think, on the Biden administration to squeeze oil prices higher. They've been helped and buoyed by some of the geopolitical tension in the Middle East. If you turn and dial that back down a little bit, is there more? Does that mean more cuts coming out of OPEC? Does that mean that they're going to continue and 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 Russia is going to be slow to bring on a line of this lot of this refining capacity? I don't know the answer to that, but it's looking awfully like a short squeeze. And if they're going to continue to squeeze oil prices to the point where it makes it vastly uncomfortable um, for the American people here at home come election time. They're going to need to do something if these tensions continue to wind wind down. So I think it's an interesting dynamic. You will see today the EIA crude oil inventory number. The API estimates a 3.3 million barrel or 3.03 million barrel build in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So that number may or may not be confirmed. Um, last month, um, um, uh, or last week, I should say, we were we were estimating a 2.2 million barrel build when that that our draw that actually came in at a build on the EIA side. So now this week they could reverse and estimate a build. We'll see what this stuff says. It's really all I got guys. Um, you will see, we, we, we didn't get the deal spotlight out today. Uh, yesterday, we're going to get that out here today. So you can listen to that. Me and John Farrell break down everything that's going on, um, with the court enter plus deal, but just check us out guys. Appreciate everybody tuning in. And, uh, with that, I'll let you guys get out of here. We'll see you tomorrow.